Hey guys, what's up? It's Evan Ross Katz. I'm senior style editor here at Mike. I'm gooped, I am gagged. My edges are officially snatched because I am joined by Brooklyn's own Aja. Hi, I broke the fourth wall after I said I wouldn't. <laughs> fourth wall. I couldn't help it. Ayo says, how are you? Uh, I'm doing lovely. I am uh, as high as I've ever been in New York City. And I mean, we're on like the 80 something floor. I don't know what's happening, but helicopters seem low right now and yeah. it's just scary. I'll keep you safe, I'll do my best. Um, we are here today to talk about drag, drag culture, and specifically to sort of zero in on some of the racism that's been surrounding the current culture and the fandom around drag race, but also drag as a whole. Um, but before we get into that, let's sort of talk about your early entry into drag. Oh boy. When did you first start doing drag? I started doing drag when I was about 16. Uh, I remember just like, I, I started doing the, the bedroom drags. You know, when you're, we call them the dragas. Like they're not actually drag queens yet. Like they're just like behind like the door and the mirror, you're stealing everyone in your household's clothing and just like uh, using blush as a contour. So you kind of just like look insane. And then, uh, but this was also pre makeup tutorial on YouTube, so. Uh, I didn't know how to do makeup and I didn't know the standards, so I was just like looking crazy. And then I had a friend who was like, oh girl, they're having drag competitions in Manhattan, you should go. And I was just like, girl, I'm 16 years old, like what am I gonna do? Uh, I think by the time I was 17, I had started going to these competitions, getting in because I was in drag, because uh, I was definitely under 21. And I remember the first time, we don't talk about that first time, but, <laughs> There were a few times after that where uh, I definitely started to like win these little local competitions. You know, the ones where you come for applause. Uh, not the drink ticket ones, because uh, I didn't have any friends who could drink. So I wouldn't join those on purpose. Uh, and then, I don't know, I just started to kind of take off. By the time I turned 21, uh, I already was hosting like some weekly shows, monthly shows. I had uh, one Mrs. Williamsburg before I even turned 21. So um, I think, I think it was all supposed to be like practice. And then I was like, I'll start taking it seriously when I'm 21. But by the time I was 21, I would think I was doing pretty okay. When did you start introducing your family and your friends to Aja? Oh, there was never a moment where I didn't. I kind of uh, just off the back was just like, well, I'm doing drag. My mom just saw me walking around heels around the house, walking in heels around the house. And she was just like, why are you wearing heels? And I was just like, I'm a drag queen. And like, it was just like, I've never, it's like the same thing with me coming out. I never had to come out. It was just like, it's my boyfriend. Like, I just don't feel the need to explain myself to, to people, especially people in my life. I'm just like, if you know me, you know me. So it sounds like RuPaul's Drag Race existed before you started doing drag. You're that young, correct? I kind of like started doing drag just right before the popularization of the show, which is weird because when you're as young as I am, you're, you kind of fall in between like uh, the millennials of drag and the, like the old school drag because uh, I'm young enough to be as young as the other queens who really started doing drag after the popularization of the show, but I'm still like doing drag. Uh, I started doing drag with the queens who were well established before Drag Race was ever created. So it's kind of, it's a weird dichotomy. When did you first say, I want to be on the show? Um, I never said I want to be on the show. I kind of just said, I'm going to be on the show. I was just like, you know what? I can be, I, like, I can be on TV. Like, like, let's be real, I was just like, girl, if a camera was to follow me everywhere, we would have a hit motherfucking show. Like, it would just be like the tea. My life is so dramatic, and not because, like, I'm, yeah, I'm dramatic, but, like, not because I'm dramatic, but it's because it's just, like, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like I just, I was made for camera. Like, I don't know how to, I don't know if it makes sense. I just feel like I was made, I'm a drama queen. That's all. You know what? I can't even lie anymore. I'm a drama queen. I'm coming out. <laughs> I love drama. But so like, you get cast on season nine, and you seemed a little bit more shy than the Aja we know today. For people, the very, very few of us have had that experience of being in that workroom. What are some of the pressures that exist that we don't see on camera? Um, I definitely think that uh, doing Drag Race, you have to go in the competition, uh, like clear, like clear-headed, like open-minded, and just kind of like chill. Uh, I feel like there's only two types of people who really succeed at Drag Race, and it's people who are so detail-oriented on everything in their life, including the way they think, and people just don't give a fuck. If you do not care about winning, you will make it really far, because I, I feel like I, the difference between me and All Stars and in Season 9 was in Season 9 I walked in and I was just like, okay, 
Um, what now? But when I walked into All Stars, I was like, girl, I don't care. I was just like, whatever happens, happens. Like, if I go home, I, I've walked through those doors before. Like, I, I've been sent home. Like, I will not be upset. Uh, season night was so upset, I went home, beat myself up for weeks, was just having, like, the dreams of getting the call, like, come back. But then after watching the show, I was like, oh, that's why I didn't come back. It began with the reunion for season nine, how meme-worthy and gifable you became, how distinctly how much fun you were having on the show. And I think that made it for the viewer, you sort of served as an avatar for us and allowed us to have fun because drag is fun. Um, was that a conscious decision you made in going in saying, I want to make sure I'm celebrating this art form? When you call me an avatar, I just imagine myself blue. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, my mind goes at a million miles per hour. But uh, no, I, when I went on season nine, I, w I had a lot of home, uh, home problems. Like I, I was in a very bad living situation at the time. I was also incredibly poor and had no resources. Like I didn't have like friends who were like, oh, can you like design this for me? Like I had a B Kala, who's a, lo who's a local Brooklyn designer, who let me pull some things from his archive, but they weren't even like custom for me. Uh, you know, I didn't have like people to be like, oh, can you make me wigs and can you make me this? And when I walked into the room, one of the first things I realized was like, wow, everyone here came with their entire wardrobe made for them. Like no queen really came here like how oh, I made everything. And I thought that that was what the show was about. So I was so confused. I was like, I guess. A lot of stuff I, I had on season nine, I made myself. So and people were like, oh, that looks like it came out of a party store shop. I'm like, well, it's because I made it. Like for me, the real, change came, honestly, was when I started making money. And I know it sounds very artificial to say, but uh, money bought me out of a terrible living situation and it bought me into a wardrobe that I really liked. And a lot of people don't realize like how much these queens are struggling before the show, you know, until you see how much they change afterward. And uh, I sort of find it really ironic when people talk about the glow up and I'm just like, there really isn't a glow up. I'm just not suffering from an immense amount of anxiety and depression. I'm just actually able to breathe. Yeah. And um, so I feel like, I feel like that's the glow up. The glow up is that I've had my, my life dose of Xanax. And uh, I mean that metaphorically. <laughs> in the beginning, when you first saw fans critiquing you, and I know you've spoken about this in the past with your makeup, can you talk about sort of the toll that that took on you emotionally at the time? Honestly, there was a point where I was like, I don't even, do I want to do this? I don't want to do drag. I don't want to do this. And um, I kind of started giving up. It was really a few months later, I did a performance at Sasha Velour's Nightgowns, where I said, you know what? I can turn this hate into something beautiful. And uh, one thing that I think sticks out about me to a lot of people that I know and love in my life is that uh, I think I exude resilience. And I think I, I've come from a very broken household and a very kind of fucked up background. And I've always just kind of like rose to the top. I feel like with where I come from, I don't think I should be successful. I don't think that somebody would be like, oh, you're gonna be a big person in, you know, in this community or this society. Anybody who probably knew me from when I was younger thought I'd be probably like killed or in jail. So, or like, or on drugs or something like, I don't know. I feel like for someone who has that background of have, being so resilient, I had to apply that idea to what was happening at that moment. And that's what I did. I said, you know what? No more time for um, crying over everything. You're gonna start doing you. And uh, a lot of people still gave me shit. And then it became, you're copying every queen. You're doing this, you're doing that. And at first I was just arguing with everybody on social media. I was like, fuck you, you don't know me, blah, 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 blah. And then I realized, why am I doing this? Uh, and it wasn't until maybe even after All Stars 3, it was like right after we finished filming, I had a talk with Valentina. She was the first person I spoke to when I got back. Uh, she had a gig in, in the UK and she stopped by her manager's house because uh, that's where I was staying. And she said, how is everything? Are you okay? And I said, I'm just scared of how I'm going to like come off. Like I just, I don't want another repeat of last year. And she said, when people see who you've become, they're going to fall in love with you. So what you, when you respond to those people online, you don't need to prove anything to them. If you know who you are, then that's all that matters. And that stuck with me because then I, at first, I was like, you know what, it was hard for me. Because when you're used to just fighting everyone in your life and you're used to fighting back and you know, trying to have a voice, uh, it's hard not to stick up for yourself. But then I took the advice eventually. Because <laughs> let's be real, I did go back a few times.
Uh, and then, you know, it just, it became easier and easier. And like, now I don't even fight with anybody online. Sometimes I'll just, I'll respond with just like a, like a go fuck yourself or just like suck a dick. I love telling people to suck a dick. But let's talk about this toxicity in the fandom. This doesn't exist on Project Runway. This doesn't exist on America's Next Top Model. These sort of retorts that you all receive online, this is unique to Drag Race. It seems that way. Why do you think this fandom has become so increasingly toxic? You know what it is? A lot of people who are fans of the show are very young and um, they kind of relate to the show and the struggles of the queens on the show because they're going through things in their life or it's like, you know, people who want to feel beautiful or want to feel loved and appreciated. And the th one thing about drag that you can always relate to is that drag has not always been loved and appreciated. Maybe it is now, but it's really being appreciated by people who relate to that struggle. And what happens is, is that people don't realize that majority of the, fan the fans of Drag Race are people who are hurt. And hurt people tend to hurt other people. So when they become so protective over these queens that they, uh, you know, have that connection to, they become defensive and they're like, oh, you know what, you're talking about Katya, like, fuck you, like, go fuck yourself, go kill yourself. And I'm just like, girl, like, for me, it's just like, girl, calm down. Um, I mean, I, I get it as, as a viewer of the show and as a huge fan of drag, I'm a huge fan of drag race. Um, but at the same time, I just feel like it, that contributes to the, toxic, the toxicity. And uh, it, it makes it worse. And then other people see other people doing it and they think it's okay. And then everyone starts to kind of gang up on one drag queen. And, uh, and then it becomes like a whole bunch of different things. It becomes classist, racist, it becomes colorist, like it becomes everything. And it's just like people start doing the low blows just to hurt someone who, you know, came at their favorite person or whatever. To me, like, I think it's a, a, to me it's just radical fanaticism. Like, it's just like, is that a word? Wow, I'm Miriam Webster now, I could not believe it. <laughs> uh, it just becomes like a thing where people are just like, going crazy. I don't know, I, honestly, I just think that these children need to take a vitamin B supplement and like some niacin, it'll really help them. Do fans ever encounter you in person and say any of this, or is it strictly online? Honestly, uh, after season nine, there was a lot of people who did shade me in person and say a lot of fucked up shit to me. Um, like, I've, I've been told, like, oh, wow, like, you know, like, there, there was somebody who tried to spit on me. There was people who, like, actually, like, tried saying they were going to hit me in my face, like, in, like, in person. Uh, I got a lot of hate in person. And then um, it was also, like, bad, too, because, like, um, a lot of people just, because Valentina was such a fan favorite and because... I attacked their favorite by complimenting her on national television. Oh, now that read off as a read. I said it very passionately, uh, which meant I agreed. But also, it was a funny moment. Uh, but people took it as hate, and they were like, you're so jealous, fuck you, blah, blah, blah. And people took that to their thing to kind of just like take it out on me in person. Can we talk about that for a minute? This idea of intention versus how fans receive things. I feel like there are a lot of incidents on the show, I wouldn't even call them incidents, just back and forth, banter between the girls that the fans then take and read into these moments and chew them apart and sort of find some meaning in it that wasn't quite there. My sense from this always, and correct me if I'm wrong, was that you and Valentina genuinely liked each other and it seems like you have a relationship off the show. And yet, the fans seemed really intent on this David and Goliath, you know. These yeah. two can't stand each other. What's that like sort of watching the fans take a plot and just keep pulling and pulling at it? Honestly, it was a shit show. It created a bit of tension, honestly, between our friendship at sometimes because uh, I would, I would uh, subconsciously blame her for how radical her fans were. But then I felt bad afterwards because I realized it's not her. She can't control all these. She she could just. It's impossible to just control all these people, and uh, you know, she she is not really big on social media because she just doesn't want to deal with it, and because she wants to like live her normal life, which I think is totally respectable. So, uh, I I don't know. Like, we always were like pretty okay with it, 
Uh, I mean, there's been a few times where after the show where I even said like kind of mean things about her publicly, which I do feel bad about like now thinking about it because I really do think that she is, um, she's not a bad person. And um, I think that she's very uh, exceptional. So um, she's totally one of a kind. And I feel like, I feel like there's nobody's business. You know what I mean? I feel like if me and her are friends and we're friends and if me and her are throwing eggs at each other's houses, we're fucking each other, like, it's nobody's business. Like, we're two people who have become public figures who, who by no means need to share our relationship with society or the public. So when people had come up to me at any given time, like, oh, are you and Valentina cool? Or like, I'm just like, I say, yeah, but like, also it's just kind of like, why are you so invested in our friendship? Like our friendship is beyond a, uh, a 30 second, extremely memeable and Emmy nominating worthy moment on national television. So it's just kind of like, I don't know, I just think we're better than that. And I, um, what was the question again? <laughs> I'm a rambler. No, no, whether or not you think that fans sort of take things and spin them, find shade where there is no shade. Absolutely. You know, it's just like, I can say, I can be here and be, I can just sit here and be like, Evan, why did you wear that shirt today? And next thing you know, I set your house on fire. <laughs> like, it's just like, people took it as like, people took everything on the show, like, oh, the, the you don't deserve Miss Congeniality thing, which received mixed reviews. But some people were like, you stole her moment, you're so jealous, you're this, you're that. And I was just like, what? Like, I was just like, were we at, we're like, you know, I, what? I also just didn't feel the need to explain myself after some point um, because I don't have to. And it seems like people have picked, on, picked that up about you these days. What were some of your early experiences in dealing with how your race played with your drag when going out to clubs? Okay, so it's always been so weird for me because uh, I'm, I'm like multiracial, but uh, I've always been faced with the racism, the colorism. Like, I kind of also felt like I never fit into like the, the the New York drag scene at first. Uh, I just remember like people would see me and my friends would be like, "Oh, that's the ratchet train," or like, uh, or like, "Oh, like, oh, they're so ratchet," or like people would accuse me of like stealing from them, or like, you know, just like doing fucked up shit, or like they just assume, or you know, they call you abrasive. You're angry. You're ghetto, and you know, I'm not just a person of color. I'm a person who comes from a very urban background. I also lived in New York all my life. Uh, so when people expect me to just be like, to act like an implant, you know, I don't come from Ohio. I didn't grow up in a fucking cornfield. Like, I grew up in the hood. Like, I just can't expect them to relate. But at first, like, it, it hurt a lot. Like, I would just be like, oh, okay, like, I felt at first, I even felt myself trying to conform myself a little bit and be like, well, I have to be on my best behavior. I have to be this, I have to be that. And I think that it's kind of like a fucked up ideology that gets installed into people of color's minds as they grow up, is that you have to whitewash yourself a little bit to be accepted in society. And um, it, it's really messed up, but it's very common and it's very often I just know, I've, I've had so many friends who are like black or Latin who, who have even gone as far as like, you know, having their birth name, but then like making like an, a more English rendition of their name for people to call them, like just because they just don't want to use their name or like because they feel uncomfortable in their skin color. And, you know, I think, I just think that that's something that I just don't understand why that has to be brought into a place where we're trying to have love and peace and we're trying to be ourselves. I just feel like a, being in drag, you're already a minority. Like not every, like we're accepting drag right now, but let's be real, a lot of people still think that we're clowns. They still think that, some of us are. A lot of people still think that, you know, this is a joke, that this is this or that. And I think everyone needs to realize that in our community, we're already fighting for that acceptance do we need to pinpoint at other places where people are still seeking acceptance it, like 
I, I don't, I just don't understand it at all. The racism that you mentioned, was that coming from promoters? Was that coming from other queens? Was that coming from club goers? Oh, it came from everywhere. Everywhere. It came from everywhere. Uh, it, came, it just like, it mostly had to do with like, your ratchet. What does that even mean? Like, like, what? Like, or the, the one I hate the most is the word sassy. I fucking hate that. Like, don't call me sassy. Like, I don't even know what sassy means, honestly. And I don't give a fuck. Like, I'm just a person who expresses myself. And if I want to be flamboyant, let me be flamboyant. Don't call me sassy. It's not an edge, it's not spicy. I hate that word too, I'm not spicy. I'm sweet, I'm wearing pink. What about colorism in the drag world? You mentioned that earlier. I hate that so much. I watch so many people. So here's the thing, with me, I, I'm black and Middle Eastern, but like a lot of people think I'm Puerto Rican or some people think I'm white or some people just think I'm black. So I feel like I become off racially ambiguous and a lot of people won't know where I fit in. But I've heard so many like colorist things of people just talking about other people's skin color or like, and it comes from everywhere. It's just like, this girl is not black enough to be black. This girl, is, you know, she's, she's a white Mexican, so she's just white. It's like, it's just like, what? It's just like, you cannot scrape someone's culture off of them because you feel like their skin color does not define the culture or race that they were born with or identify with. So I'm just like, I've seen that everywhere and I'm just like, this makes no sense. I hate racial division in drag, by the way. I think it's so dumb, I think it's stupid, and it doesn't really happen as much in New York as I've experienced it happening in other places, especially after touring. There's a lot of cities where I realize like, I'll, be, I'll, be the only, like, I'll be the only girl of color in the entire cast, or I'll be like, in another place, I'll be like the lightest skinned girl in the cast, and I'll just be like, wow, I'm just assuming, which I shouldn't assume, but this cast was picked so specifically. And I'm just like, I don't understand. I just wish there was so much more of a mixture in places like where people can just kind of get along and just like, you know, it, it sucks because it never will be that way. Uh, well, never say never. It may not be that way now, but I, I hope people take an approach and like a step forward to just making it happen. I feel like, I just feel like it's part of what Martin Luther King stood up for. It's just like everyone being together, not you know, not radical colorism or telling someone that they're not this or that. Like, can we just be? I just wish we were all grayscale, honestly. Then next thing you know, one person, you're 10% grayer than me. <laughs> yeah. There was an argument that started in the workroom that went into Untucked in a recent episode of Drag Race that really got the fandom and many past queens on the show talking. In reading a lot of the articles that have been written about it, I find it really interesting how many people struggled to explain exactly what had happened in that moment. Can you describe in your view what that fight, if you even want to call it a fight, what you would say played out on the show? To me, that was not a fight. To me, that was, uh, that was the same distress of help coming from two different points of view. And here's the thing. <clears throat> I have a lot to say about this. Um, okay, I'm gonna start off by <clears throat> breaking down what I thought about each of them and then like what I thought about the whole thing. And I'm gonna start off with Aquaria. I feel like Aquaria was coming from a point of view where I, I've worked with Aquaria for years. I know her Aquaria is not a racist person. I've never heard her say anything about a black person this or a colored person. I've never heard her say anything like that. Uh, and Aquaria is a big supporter of like me and my drag family, so uh, I know that she would never do that. And we're all we're all of color, so to me that'd be stupid. Um, but I think Aquaria at the time was just acting out of her ass and you know doing what twenty one year olds do sometimes. And she was just like she was carrying, like she was just living her best her best truth and like being a reality TV star but not realizing that by falling in victim at that moment, especially as someone who is socially, as socially awkward as Aquaria, because let's be real, she's fucking awkward. Like she's not, she's not like, hi, how are you? She's very like, hey, hi. Like that's who she is. And if that's who she is, that's great for her. But that opposing against someone who is very 
sure of their personality, as Vixen, who I think exudes confidence and she exudes excellence, she's so outspoken, that will seem like a fight and it'll seem like one is picking on the other. And of course, to fandom or people who are close-minded, it's gonna seem like Vixen is an angry black person, you know, going off on this sad little white girl. However, I don't think that that was what was intentionally the case, but I do agree that it was perpetuating that storyline, that narrative that, you know, it was, it was a race thing. I thought that the best moment and the strongest part of that entire untucked was when Vixen exclaimed and she said, leave me alone, because that is the strongest thing you can do. I think for the fans out there, what you don't realize is the more you throw hate at something, honestly, it just seems the more you're mad about their success. And I think that we're at a day and age where people of color are very successful. And it doesn't matter what they say to Vixen. The Vixen's famous now. She's a star, she's making money. And um, she's gonna listen more to what Benjamin has to say to her than she's gonna listen to what Bobby and Sally, who are 12 years old behind a computer, have to say. So, Vixen, make that money. I know we've seen several queens speak directly to their fan bases. Valentina did that, I know Aquaria did that in this situation, and I'm sure that that works. And one of the things I thought was great about Aquaria's message was that if you are sending this hatred to Vixen, I do not want you to be a fan of mine. Oh yeah. You know, really condemning them. Someone responded and was like, oh, maybe you shouldn't treat your fans that way. And she said, I don't give a shit if you think you're my fan and you're being racist. I, if you're being racist, I don't like that. And I was just like, ham to you, Aquaria. Like, that's amazing. Like, stick up. It's, you know, it's one thing because, uh, you know, people of color are always gonna stick up for people of color. But when you have someone who is a white ally, it helps spread the message. Because let's be real, sometimes white people only listen to white people. I mean, it sucks, but that's just the truth. And the more people who, you know, I think even other queens who, from the show who are white should speak up on it. Preferably the ones with bigger fan bases. Yeah. You know, like if, if somebody like, I don't know, like, well, it's also hard because you, sometimes you think that the queens are white, but they're not even white. That's another thing. Yeah. Uh, I want to mention the queens. You said several queens did speak out. I want to read some of the tweets of those that did. Yes. So Jiggly Caliente said, last night's RuPaul Drag Race Untucked was a conversation that needed to happen. It's a difficult conversation to have, but it's needed. Much love to both girls, Aquaria and the Vixen, and most importantly, all the queens of color. Tatiana, that Untucked left me with high blood pressure and confused as fuck. Like, let me not even get into it. I'll say this, you can't be the aggressor and the victim all at once. I can't. Gag. Aja, racism and drag and on television is a conversation way overdue, which was you responding to Monet Exchange, who said, I'm happy that we are having this conversation on TV. Oh, yes. Interesting to note, those are, there might have been other queens that spoke out, but those are the ones that I found. Those are all queens of color. Were you surprised to not see more queens, specifically white queens, addressing what had happened on the show? Yes, I feel like, uh, I feel like here's the thing. I feel like sometimes uh, white people in general feel scared to talk about it, not because they're gonna be shunned, but I feel like, uh, I feel like it's a very sensitive topic also for people who are not of color. And um, you, know, a lot, you know, a lot of white people don't wanna feel like the antagonist off the back so they stay silent. What they don't realize is that by staying silent, you're contributing to that uh, antagonism. Like you're, you're, you're just as bad for not speaking up. So I think that my best advice for people who are not of color, especially like the, non, the white queens of the show, should also speak up about it. I think everybody should be talking about it. This is not just a, a topic for us. This is a topic for everyone. And this is something everyone should be talking about because it's not just a problem in the drag community, it's a, it's a problem in the world. And this is being shown on primetime television. Mm. Millions of people are watching this conversation happen. It is important to talk about it. It's not important to go online and call Vixen angry, like I've seen a lot of people do. It's not important to go online and call Aquaria a crybaby. It's important to talk about how important it is to bring attention to how terrible 
people of color are received on television sometimes, especially when there is a white person in the mix. And I think it's something everyone should be talking about. That makes me want to address something that you said on Instagram Live <clears throat> last night. Me always talking. Yeah, and I'm always watching. Uh, they said what you said, white drag queens do tend to pick on the black queens and the queens of color because they think people won't have our back. What did you mean by that? There's been many times where I've witnessed that there's just like a group or like even larger like groups of white queens who will like kind of like pick on the one black queen in the cast or like they'll give her less credit for what she did or it's like oh you know uh it's basic it's like oh that black queen is turning it all over the city and then we have this white queen who's her best friend who started drag two weeks ago let's give an opportunity to the white queen i've seen it happen so many times it's happened to me it was so hard for me to get gigs in manhattan when I, uh, when I first started doing drag. And uh, you know, I'm not gonna name names. I don't need to name names because those people know who they are and they have to live with that. I don't. But girl, people have our backs. And everywhere there is going to be a black queen, a queen of color, a Latin queen, who's going to be like, you're talented. I'm gonna give you a platform. And like, you know, I just, I, I want people to be recognized for their talent, not their color, not their race, not any of that. And I feel like that's something that happens very commonly, uh, actually also in the New York scene. It maybe hasn't happened, I, I, I can't speak for what's happened in the last two years because I've been absent, but. Uh, She's booked. But, uh, you know, I, when I do, I do see that it's a lot more open now and a lot more queens of color are coming up and they're really like turning the party. But I really hope they're getting the opportunity and uh, getting the, the gigs they deserve and getting paid what they're yeah. owed because they're talented. They're just as talented. Shangela spoke about there being a sort of whisper network among some of the queens with regards to this promoter won't pay you on time or just sort of looking out for each other. Is there something similar amongst the queens of color? Um, I don't mean necessarily like a group chat, but are you guys talking to one another when you deal with racist promoters or just racism within the fandom in general? Are these conversations you guys are offlining about? No, but I think we should. I think it's important for us to communicate. I, I am very fortunate to never have had to deal with racism from a promoter. Uh, so I think that's amazing. Um, I would never want to work with somebody who lives their lifestyle that way. It's a very disgusting lifestyle. Um, but um, I think it is important that the queens of color do, to, I think also the white, I think everyone, everyone. I don't think a white queen should work with a racist promoter either. Either Why, br why bring this person more money and power than they already think they have? Racism comes from a place of ego. Like, Racism is just, uh, it's basically just a new word for like ethnocentricism. Like it's just people who, that's the word, right? Yeah. I'm just making sure. <laughs> See, I'm educated. <laughs> you know, it's just like a new way for people to like think that they're superior to other people. And like, it just brings it back to back in the day. And yeah. like, girl, this ain't back in the day. We ain't in that time. Segregation is over. Slavery is over. Let's not... Uh, perpetuate that in modern society because just because it's not happening in word or in law does not mean it's not happening metaphorically. So don't perpetuate that. You said that people want to say that color is an issue but you're not there when people have to deal with injustice. For people that haven't experienced this before, how are the people around you reacting? Do you find that the community as a whole, when they see incidents like, incidents like this, are lifting you up, are there to support you? I think that uh, I am very fortunate to have an amazing like, fan base and people who will uh, really just like, make me feel better when these things happen. But uh, you know, to be real, when you're a victim of colorism or anything like that, it doesn't feel good. Um, Every time I go through an airport and I know that they do a double check on me because I'm Middle Eastern, uh, it hurts. And, um, you know, there's nothing that's gonna take that away. Every time it happens, it's gonna feel the same way. It's gonna feel like, oh, cause you know, it'll be like me and my boyfriend, it'll be like, oh, are you, are you gonna double check him too? No, it's just standard procedure. 
Okay. Work. Everywhere. So there's a standard procedure everywhere. Okay. Like stuff like that. Uh, it's just like, you can't really stop that from happening unless, <laughs> unless you're there at the moment. You know what I'm saying? So it, uh, but the people are good at speaking up and saying like, that, that's, that's not right. Uh, but it happens everywhere. Or like, it, it could even be the smaller things of colorism of like when people like to tell you like, oh, oh, I've heard this so many times. Like when people be like, oh, like what's your background? I'm like, oh, I'm black, I'm Middle Eastern. You're not black. I'm just like, how can you tell somebody what they are or what they're not? Like, do I need to go to 23andMe right now? Like, to give you my roots? Like, what do you want? Like, it's something that Cardi B actually said. And I know that Cardi B said a lot of questionable things, but Cardi B said something very, very right and very smart. And she said it on Twitter, actually. Uh, I might be lying. No, I, I have it. You have it? Yeah. And she said, oh, I retweeted it, I think. <laughs> yeah. uh, Cardi B said, uh, you know, like, I don't need to, like, people will tell me, like, oh, you're not black. I don't need to tell you I'm black. You should know that. Yeah. You said, Cardi B's racial identity is not up for debate. Believe it or not, one can be both black and Hispanic. That was you quote tweeting her tweet. Yeah, like, I feel like, you know, people don't realize, like, you can be from more than one place. Like, is she, if that's who she is, that's who she is. And also people, it's just nobody's business. Like, stop trying to racially police people. Stop it. Like, stop color policing people. I want to talk about fans whitewashing queens, which is something that we sort of spoke about briefly earlier. Violet you got Ch a lot from my Instagram live yesterday. Hello. Violet Tchotchke, Miss Fame, Trixie Mattel, etc. There's a number of queens of color who are not regarded by many fans as queens of color. Yes. I'm wondering where you situate that conversation and who the onus is on. No matter what, you cannot erase someone's culture. The fan base is just not recognizing some of the queens as their actual ethnicity or like race, especially um, after Trixie won All Stars, a lot of people were like, oh, the white queen won, like blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, you know, regardless of whatever fucked up shit you thought went down, I didn't know Trixie was Native American, but Native American people are technically people of color. And if Trixie, Tr Trix, honestly, Trixie is the whitest person on the, in this world. Trixie's like whiter than West Virginia and mayonnaise. So, but that's just how she presents herself. Yeah, and she'll but, even joke about it. But this. you cannot take away the fact that she's Native American. She may be, 25% Native American, but she's still 25% a person of color. And it, you know, it, it doesn't mean anything to some people, but it, it, you can't take that away from her. She is not just a white queen. You should refer to her as a white Native American queen. Or just queens like Violet Tchotchke, who, um, who may I just say, I, I'm obsessed with Violet Tchotchke. Like if I could be Violet Tchotchke, I would sell everything, including my soul. Violet Tchotchke has this very like Patrick Nagel, like Gita Von Teese, like burlesque, meets like 80s like grunge type of drag. And you know, yeah, it's not the most Latin thing in the world, but <laughs> believe it or not, she's Ecuadorian. Like she, you can't take that away from her. Wasn't that her excuse when she went on Drag Race was visiting family in Ecuador? I hope it's Ecuador, because I'll, like, I'll feel like crap if it's not Ecuador. <laughs> but like, <laughs> who knows, but she's <laughs> Latin. And like, uh, I've had a conversation with Miss Fame where Miss Fame, you know, I asked her, I was like, oh, where are you from? And I think she told me that, uh, like, you know, her grandparents are Mexican. And like, it's things like this that, you know, you would never know, <clears throat> but you can't just write someone off as, oh, another white queen. You should really educate yourself on where people are from before you police them. Yeah. Uh, which, when you put it in that way, it kind of changes how, how much the ratio of queens of color that you think have been on Drag Race and then have actually been on Drag Without Race. Without a doubt. Where do you want this conversation to go? I feel like the, what happened on Untucked and subsequently what happened online opened up a ton of dialogue. It feels like it's ricocheting all over the drag sphere right now without anyone sort of knowing what to, where to place this energy. And the energy is very palpable. Yes. Where would you like to see this conversation go? I would love for it to just become a thing where, honestly, awareness and education is the best thing, best place for this conversation to land. I don't want it to be an argument. I, I just want it to be like, this is the, these are the facts, and this is what we need to work on. And I think it's something we need to just do as a community, is just say, we need to be more aware of the racism and colorism and the classism in the drag community, in the LGBTQ plus, IA, LOL, God, I don't even know anymore. 
like we need to really hone in on educating everyone that there are these secondary issues beyond everything else that are happening and they're very important. And people need to let their friends and their friends of their friends and their friends of their friends and their friends of their friends know not to be a fucking bigot. No, before we end, I want to find out lastly what's next for you. I know you have Femme the Film. I know you have your debut EP coming out. Can you tell us a little bit more about these projects and what's ahead? Yes. Uh, so I did film Femme the Film last year. So sometimes I don't even remember it. And then I see it everywhere. And I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, I'm like, oh wait, Corey made a film. And I'm like, wait, I was in it. <laughs> but uh, I watched it and I saw it. And it was so funny and it was so great. And everyone should check out Femme the Film. It's amazing. Corey is so inspiring as a person and he's such a beautiful person inside and out and uh, I'm very fortunate to have met him in nightlife and worked with him and uh, uh, I hope that people get the message from the, the film because it, it really just preaches about how uh, there's this like whole masculine dominance thing in, um, in the gay community and it's just kind of like stupid and tired. I, I, I kind of I kind of I honestly hate just like the, there's just such a condescendence towards uh, femininity in the gay community sometimes, where it's just like uh, people like make those who are more feminine feel less than or less appropriate. I honestly think that the people who are more feminine have the upper power. Um, I mean, pussy power, like without a pussy, I wouldn't be here, so. There you go. We found the source of power. Uh, I should never do that again. Um, <laughs> I also have my EP. My EP will be coming out uh, DragCon weekend. Uh, the fans are very excited. Well, I feel like I feel like my 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 music is just really weird. From it's just really weird because I don't want to do like music as a drag queen. I don't look at myself as a drag queen who does music. I look at myself as a musical artist who just happens to do drag. Uh, which is why like in my music videos I'll incorporate myself out of drag because I, you know it's the real artist is him not her she's just a channel of exp uh, of expression uh, I'll also be releasing um, my new music video uh, around that week we're not setting a hard date yet well thank you so very much I can't think of anyone I'd rather spend my birthday with than it's Aja. your birthday. It's my birthday happy birthday thank Evan <laughs> thank you clap <laughs> <laughs> No, but really, thank you. I think that there have been many very talented queens on this show, but there is something unique about you that I don't want to choose favorites, but I just think that you possess a talent that is felt by so many people. When we put uh, on Twitter asking for questions, the amount of questions that flooded in, is there's just so clear interest and love for you within the fans, and I think it's so obvious as to why. Uh, and we cannot wait to see what you do next, because literally, I just think... You've already done so much, but there's just so much great stuff ahead. I'm honored to sit with you. Oh, stop it, stop it. I'm, I'm just an open book, you know? I'm not afraid to share all of me with everyone. I know I was talking shit earlier about like, you know, this is my personal life. But honestly, like, I want everyone to just see me for who I am. Not just a persona, not just my art. Like, see me and appreciate me. So I, I think I'm very accessible. Just don't leave balloons in front of my house, it's weird. That happened once. I won't do it again. <laughs> it wasn't even my birthday. <laughs>